Thank you. Hello, everyone. Isn't, isn't technology grand? It's part of our new life and our new understanding and our new abilities, but it causes its own little issues from time to time. And now I've got this really stylish long earring that I'll try not to stand on. But welcome one and all to the program. A couple of things. If you, are, if you filled out one of these things, you can give it to me uh, at some point after the program. Two, I would like the choir to stand up, please. You are my models. Do you see these lovely t-shirts? This was a project during my sabbatical last year. Uh, Becky Solomon was the brains behind it, but Craig Fennell was the designer behind it. And if you would like one of these lovely t-shirts, here is your commercial announcement. We sell them for $10 each. There you go. I was told I had to do that. You know me, I have to shill when I can. But as we begin, welcome to Beautiful Savior. Where's my, it was like, where's my MC? MC car. It's still morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody, and peace be with you. So, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Congregational Council, President uh, Dick, wherever you're at, I see him, there he is. And all of us at Beautiful Savior, thank you for being here on this beautiful day. And all I can say is this is a celebration about us, about who we are as a church, as a people. So thank you for being here. We've got a couple of things to go through today. We get to spend about, hopefully, an hour, Pastor David? Maybe less? So I, have, I, 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 I bring forth this greeting to my, my fellow speakers. It's the rules of the three B's. Be brief, brother, be brief. Or the BSB, be, you know what I mean, <laughs> sister. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce myself. My name is Randy Carr. For those that don't know me, I've been at this church with my lovely family for a very, very long time. And just part of my, serum, or my, whatever you want to call it, story is that my aunt and my uncle were one of those people that helped Pastor Dan bring this church together. And I was part of that as a young boy. Pastor Dan actually confirmed me in 1977. He was my faith journey as a young teenager who was wrestling with all the things that we do on a daily basis as kids trying to find ourselves, he was my guiding light. So now I have Pastor David as my spiritual leader and he also, despite his bad jokes, <laughs> he has given me a light like no other. So from my perspective, my journey has been with this church for a very, very long time. Obviously I have a connection I did marry up big time. <laughs> Rhonda Carr is the director of our preschool and our, our school, the academy. And uh, we have a running joke. She, I'm going to get her into retirement. She's going to get me into heaven. So <laughs> that's what we're working on, folks. <clears throat> so without further ado, I ask our speakers. We have a long, long program. And we have more speakers than we have time. And unfortunately, we had to go through that exercise of trying to pare it down a little bit and prioritize because we know that people um, have other things to do. Although this is a great occasion, we, we know that we've been here all morning. So what we want to do is we want to make it just fun-filled, informational-packed, and most importantly, spiritually uplifting because what we have done in 45 years at Beautiful Savior Lutheran Church is truly amazing. So with that, what I would like to do is bring up the man who actually started this whole, whatever you want to call it, stuff, Pastor Dan Hodson, who I have known for such a very long time. Pastor, make your way up. And he and his family have been dear to us, and I just want to give him a round of applause and say thank you for being here. <laughs> Pastor Dan. I 
have this thing. It's a taser. Ooh. So uh, it's in my back pocket. So you got three minutes. Okay. <laughs> Just to share a few tidbits, and the first one is a quiz. Who knows the church phone number? What is it? Dorothy, you know it. <laughs> but do you know that it's 744 book? Yeah, there you go. Okay, how many of you sat on orange chairs? Good. They blamed me for choosing that color for a long time. <laughs> One day at the academy, I, back when we were, had the offices in the other building, uh, I happened to go into the restroom, and as I walked out, there was a little boy going in, and he says, hi, God. Humbling. I didn't. Obviously, I've remembered that all these years, and uh, it's kept my feet on the ground for sure. Another one was uh, when this sanctuary went up, and when they finally put the steeple up on the top, there was a man, Larry Martin, one of the saints, who couldn't wait to see me and say, I could see the church all the way from Costco. <laughs> oh, what, what memories I have, right? <laughs> A more serious one. Um, we had two arson fires. And I, when I write my book in the, in the by and by, it's going to have a chapter. Beautiful Savior engages in international politics. The story is, there was a young man who lives, I had to get my directions here. Is that Mazingale? That way. The memory's the second thing to go. Can't remember the first. The Mazingale, he lived in the next street over, I forgot the name of the street, whatever it is. He lived over there, and it happened that his family were devout um, Hispanic Catholics. And he met a Muslim girl who was from Bosnia, Herzegovina. And they were sweethearts, and apparently she told the story to him of how the Christians persecuted the Muslims at that time in those countries. And for whatever reason, that stirred up so much anger in him and anger at his church. And we became the symbol of his anger. We were the Christians that did bad to his girlfriend's family. And so at first, we were collecting newspapers and somebody built a bin outside the, the uh, patio wall. And that got set on fire. And uh, so that, that burned up the papers and so on, but it was OK. But then, like October, when this church was being constructed, 1992, three, two, 90, what year was it? Two, 92, 93, whatever. Anyway, it was under construction. They had um, cyclone fence around the building site. And I got a call from the council president, Jim German, who lived not far from here. He said, the telephone, the church is on fire. And I'm thinking, this whole place under construction is burning. So I ran, came, I didn't run, I took the car. I came over, and the fire department was there. They had burned what's now the academy office building, actually the end of the building. The fire department, didn't need to, but they cut the doors with their chainsaws. Sorry. And, and they, but the fire was outside. I know. I know. Talk about gratitude 
Anyway, anyway, uh, that was the first fire, and it's like October. And so there, we contracted a, con a contractual contractor company, and the first thing they did is they went into the bathrooms and they took all the toilets out and lined them up on the on the cyclone fence uh, that divided the patio. And we had just started the preschool. And here parents are bringing their little precious ones. And all they see are toilets lined up. <laughs> and I thought for sure, some of these parents are going to quit right away. So we got it all fixed up by Christmas. And we thought, oh, wow, wonderful. Got another telephone call, January 1st, 1970. Four. The church is on fire. 94. Thank you. Came over again, and this, what we found out, this young man had taken a dry old Christmas tree, laid it, uh, found out in the street, stuffed it in the restroom entry, and burned that time. It was serious, serious everything. Well, and I'm gonna, this is my finishing story. We had people in law enforcement in the congregation and they got the inside story and that's how I found out about his girlfriend who was Muslim and so on and so forth and, and why he picked on us to, to burn. And um, so his trial came and it was gonna be a trial before the judge and I and council president at that time and a couple other people decided to go to the court, and, and we did. And so the, the judge asked if anyone wanted to say anything about this young man, and I, I spoke up and I said, we, from the church that he set on fire, would really like to see him get help. Is there any way that you can uh, order him to be in a program of rehabilitation? And the judge, agreed and he put him in what was then a like a boot camp rehabilitation unit uh, up in Florence and uh, and he was ordered you can't come closer than 500 feet when you get out <laughs> and he did thank you many many stories wonderful thanks for letting me be here today Thank you, Pastor Dan. Boy, he was right on key, too. Did you see that? That was pretty amazing. And we'll just, uh, you keep the preaching to you, and I'll keep the firefighting to me. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> so our, our, next, uh, our next speaker is actually a video, and uh, this is going to be Dr. Jim Pence, who is one of the charter members. So, Kevin, can you cue the video? Hi everyone, my name is Jim Pence. And I'm Jan. We now live in Alexandria, Minnesota, but 45 years ago we lived in Tucson and were founding members of Beautiful Savior. We were among the hearty band of people who, worshipers who gathered at Thornida Elementary on February 5th, 1978 for the very first time. And we were in the music room of the school that day when we chose the name Beautiful Savior. I think we first met the Hudson family when they moved from New York uh, to Tucson in 1975. In fact, we remember helping unload their moving truck. <laughs> and, and I remember the time we took care of um, Amy, Dan, and Tim when Dan and Jane took a weekend away. We were still a young couple without children at that point, and the experience helped us understand that being parents was hard and wonderful. It also connected us with the family in meaningful ways. They realize that their children are now in their 50s with children of their own, and what a beautiful family. Yeah, and now that we have our own grandchildren, it's even more remarkable. I, I still remember the day that Pastor Dan baptized our firstborn daughter, Katie, in the cafetorium of the school on the baptism of Jesus Sunday in January of 1979. What amazes me is that we left Tucson in the summer of 1979, but Beautiful Savior 
and Dan and Jane Hodson have been in our hearts ever since. I remember that you helped type bulletins for the first edge from your office at the University of Arizona. And we sang in the choir and we kept in touch with many of our beautiful Savior friends for many years. Those memories are precious. After I finished my PhD at the U of A, we moved around the country to a variety of Lutheran congregations and, and colleges, including three ELCA colleges. The experiences of uh, beginning a congregation from scratch in a school with a pastor we loved has stayed with us for all of these years. We've seen beautiful Savior in Tucson. Um, we visited Dan and Jane a few years ago. It's a beautiful place, beautiful Savior. When I think about beautiful Savior, I'm always reminded of the first line from that great hymn, Born in Cry. We can say, we were there to hear your born in cry, beautiful Savior. And for us, we rejoice the day our daughter was baptized. Just think of how many children have followed our Katie to the best baptismal font in, for over 45 years. <laughs> our child, Katie, um, who was baptized at Beautiful Savior is a graduate of Luther Seminary and now works on the staff at Calvary Lutheran here in Alexandria with our son-in-law, who is the lead pastor of the church. Do you think Beautiful Savior influenced her life in the church? You know, that's, that's a question that's way above my pay grade. But what I can say is that our time at Beautiful Savior influenced our life of faith. And some of that may have rubbed off on her, I'm sure. I can also say that Dan and Jane helped shape us as people of faith who understand that we're called to serve others as followers of Jesus. Congratulations to 45 years of ministry to the people of Beautiful Savior. We wanted to, to know how important your congregation has been to our lives. We're grateful for your continued presence in the place we adored. So that was Tucson. Why do we live here? This is Minnesota. Mm. Well, anyway, best wishes for a great celebration, beautiful Savior. Congratulations. He was one of the two that went to the principal. In a good way. In a good way. But yeah. Thank you, Dr. Pence, and, and I think that that's just representative of who we are. So now what I'd like to do is to ask Nancy to try to make her way forward. Can you guys roll Nancy forward to us here? Nancy Hively, one of the sweetest ladies that ever walked the planet, and roll two. She's, she's the sweetest person that ever rolled the planet. She has a few words to say as well, as she is a charter member. Remember, Nancy, three minutes, three minutes. Uh, no, we need to put you on. Just, just you know, I, I want to say thanks to God for Nancy and her bright smile and the fact that right now she's definitely a holy roller. Oh, boy. Have you ever seen me holy roll? Woo! Yes. <laughs> well, many of the, I'm Nancy Hively, and I'm glad to be here. You don't know how hard I tried to get here. And I want to talk about a few things, not as long as Pastor Dan. Nobody could be that windy. <laughs> and um, Challenge accepted. Amen. And you and your jokes are not, so. <laughs> um, I was one of the ones that started out in the school, and uh, we had a good time. We'd set up the orange chairs and, and then, of course, take them all down. And I think we had cookies and coffee. And juice, maybe. Oh, boy, am I lucky. And um, I won't tell anything but the truth. Um, I love Pastor Dan. Uh, no offense, Jan. I mean, you know, Jane. Um, you got him first. You can have it. Um, my married name was Anderson. A N D first part. So that put me in the front part of the charter membership. I, I cheated. So without him, without Pastor Dan, there would be no beautiful Savior. 
Let me tell you. We, we met for uh, choir practice. I think there were about eight of us. And that's gone a long way. And then, I don't even know if we had robes, but I don't, probably, oh, we had those short little white coats and brown skirts. That's what, the men looked terrific in them. <laughs> and, uh, but, but I will give you a short, man. I will always be a standing member of this church. And I'll tell you why. My brother-in-law, and sister, it was Mike's mother, after she passed away and the church was built, this mountain behind us was donated by them. So they'll always be a standing member of the church. Pastor Dan and I have been through births, baptisms, <coughs> confirmations, weddings, grandchildren, grandchildren, and grandchildren. And now I have three wonderful sons. Now I lost one son a few years ago, but he's interred in Memorial Garden, along with my second husband, Gil. And I go, every time I come here, I go to the garden and I talk to him. I've told Jeff about the World Series, my husband Jeff about the Masters Golf Tournament, <laughs> and this week, if I get a chance, I'll go talk to him about the Super Bowl. I'm a, I'm a fond with four boys, wouldn't you be a sports fan? <laughs> and the funerals that I've had here are for my husband J Gil and my son Jeff. A peaceful place where I could visit and remember loved ones. This is not easy for me. My husband Gil and son Jeff, and my best of all friends in this entire city of Tucson, Arizona, was a lady called Lenny Pfeiffer. <laughs> Lenny was the one that would meet you at the door always had a smile, always had an open hand for everybody, and it was there if you were sick, having a baby, getting married, Lenny was there. She was my dearest and best friend, and I lost her a short time ago. But she is maybe not interred in the memorial garden, but her ashes, I understand, are on the cross in Memorial Garden. So she's with us and always will be. And I'm sorry for you people that didn't get a chance to know her because she was an instrument of God. And I will always cherish her. Before the church was built, we lived, went to the school, as you all heard. But some of the things you don't know is that the eight of us, I think there were eight of us, we've multiplied girls and boys, and I'm proud of you. <laughs> but they would practice in my sister and brother-in-law's house. And Lois would play her piano, and the eight of us would sing. Every Thursday night, we'd practice, and dedicated we all were, and we loved it. Our choir has meant so much to me. My sister Lois and I sang in the choir, sang solos, and on Christmas Eve, my sister would sing, Oh, Holy Night, and rock this rolls because it was beautiful. And if you didn't hear her, I'm sorry, because she had a voice like an angel, and she still is alive, 90 years old, in Nevada. And we keep in touch. As I said before, Doug and Lenny Pfeiffer, Carol and Jim Olson, and their daughter Cynthia have been a blessing to me.
Their daughter Cynthia is my caretaker, and I can't thank the Lord enough for her. Joan and Don Swanson are good friends of mine. We keep in touch, as does Mary Spidell and I. I want to tell you people, there's no place like beautiful Savior. You'll never find nicer, warmer place of God than right here in these walls. And I may have left something out, I hope not. Because there's not enough I can say about this place. And I, I have a big mouth and I can really say a lot. <laughs> but it's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful to see all of you. Pastor Dan, Pastor David, who I gave a hard time to. But I just, I don't want to go on and on and on because it's just, it's just too much. But I'm so grateful. Thank you, Nancy. See what I tell you? She is the sweetest. Oh, let, go. oh, let her go. I was waiting for that. Thank you so much, Nancy. But it, I think she brings up a great point. This is what we are, beautiful Savior. I can tell you, talking about Doug and Lenny, I mean, when I was in high school in biology class in 1975, I think this girl named Wendy sat behind me. She'd flick me in the back of the ears, you know. I kind of had a crush on her. Don't tell Igor, but, you know. <laughs> Anyways, so, yes, we are a family. And speaking of families, now I have the real pleasure and honor to introduce someone that's very close to me. And that is the lady that has been, she's on loan. She's going to go back and get her master's degree, and, and um, she's just going to do this academy thing part-time. So, um, but... <laughs> This certain lady that I, I happened to marry in 1986, Rhonda Carr, who is the director of our academy, would like to give us a brief history and a personal reflection about the academy. Let's give her a round of applause. Well, I'll start by sharing a brief synopsis of the history of the academy for those of you who weren't around 31 years ago. The Miss Cassie actually brought a came to beautiful savior um, searching for a place for her co-op preschool. She had been renting space at another church, but that was no longer an option. Although the timing of it was a bit off, it was a vision of Pastor Dan's and the church at large. So ultimately it was agreed that we would offer Miss Cassie a place for her preschool. There was one condition. She was not going to rent the space, but rather it would be a ministry of our church. The academy was slotted to open that August, but as Pastor Dan uh, mentioned when he spoke, we had an arsonist, and so it was delayed. Finally, in October, Beautiful Savior Co-op Preschool opened. Miss Cassie completed that school year and then resigned and decided to return to home daycare. That's where I came into play. As a member of the preschool team, we were having difficulty finding somebody to fill her spot. The academy had to be self-sufficient financially, so there was little left to pay a director teacher. Long story short, I would fill in until we were able to find somebody, at which point... <laughs> that was 30 years ago. I had, I had ambitions of going back to school and getting my master's degree. I had done an internship at Sierra Tucson, and I was going into counseling. Apparently, God, that, God thought that was funny. Because 30 years later, I'm still here. I did eventually return and get my master's, but it was in education instead. Here I was, myself, 12 students, one of which was my own, and parent helpers. We were housed in the south building of what is now the academy. We also worshiped in that building. So every weekend, the preschool furnishings were moved to the patio. Church was set up with those beautiful orange chairs. And then following worship, the orange chairs were stacked and the preschool furnishings were reassembled inside for the week. It wasn't long until we were able to hire a second teacher. Miss Terry came to us. 
And at that point, we discontinued parent volunteers. As you can imagine, that was a nightmare. At that time, we became Beautiful Savior of Preschool, and we operated 9 to 12, August to May. The dates are all in the program because I don't remember. As we continued to grow, we added staff and divided the South Building into classrooms. We had rolling dividers that were also our bulletin boards. Then eventually, we stepped up and got permanent dividers, like the cubby holes that you see in offices. My office was a cubby hole in classroom one. So imagine trying to conduct business with little kids screaming and yelling and teachers at their finest. We continued to expand and increase our hours, and we also decided to add kindergarten. At that point, again, a name change, Beautiful Savior Academy. The first year of kindergarten was actually housed right there in the cry room. However, with the completion of the fellowship hall, the buildings were remodeled to accommodate permanent classrooms, what we have now. There were lots of growing pains along the way, but skip to now, we have five classrooms that operate daily, serving children three through kindergarten. Approximately 90 students are currently enrolled. Our hours have increased to 8 to 5.30, and we have a seven-week summer program. The academy has a staff of 10, including myself, and of course, our long-term volunteer, Linda Spain. In fact, I think I have some teachers here, so they could um, stand up. Miss Mary? Miss Mary's teaching our kindergarten, and she's also the assistant director. Miss Lisa? Miss Lisa has been here with me for at least 15 years, probably longer. Seth is 22? Oh, okay, she's been here a long time. <laughs> she's our advanced pre-K teacher. She's also thinking about retirement. And then Miss Cindy, um, she currently, she, she taught preschool and after program, but currently she's our music teacher. So I think that's all that's here, right? We can give them a big hand. <laughs> One more important note, when the pandemic hit, we only shut down from late March to the end of May. With the full support of my staff and them asking, we reopened that June in order to continue to serve our families that needed care. The Academy has not only benefited our church financially over the past many years, but more importantly, we have served our community by providing a loving Christian environment where parents can feel safe leaving their children. We've served thousands of children over the years. In fact, I now have past students bringing their children to us. My son, one of them. Aside from our excellent staff and proven curriculum, there's much more happening in our classrooms and in the minds of our students. I believe it was about 20 years ago at our 25th anniversary, I spoke on the behalf of, of the Academy. The night prior, I found out that my niece had been murdered. She had lost her way in this world. I said then, and I still believe that this is why the Academy is so important. In this world of entitlement, selfishness, and violence, we are able to share the love of God. We plant the seeds of faith. We give our students a sense of belonging, and we encourage them to accept people and all their differences. In fact, you may have seen on Facebook, our classes, our classes right now have their kindness buckets displayed. Hopefully this early foundation helps each little one that passes through our doors to never lose their way. Thank you. Hold on there. Not so fast, young lady. So we have the academy uh, team. What are you, El Presidente or? Uh, Long-term member. Long-term <laughs> member. Jody Layton that would like to say just a few short words to Rhonda. Okay. We're going to stay right there with Miss Emma Lou. So Rhonda already hit on a few things um, that I figured she would say, but if she didn't, I would say it. Um, but we definitely can't let today go unnoticed that it is 30 years that she has dedicated her service and her life and her love to this community and their families. I'm going to try really hard to not cry. So today, I stand here wearing lots of hats, one being your teammate 
on the ministry team for probably 20 years because we came to this church when Emma was one. And one of the reasons we came was because of the academy, and I knew she would be able to go to preschool here. So that's the first hat I wear as your teammate. The second is a grateful parent for what she got to experience here for the three years that she got to do preschool and kindergarten. I'm also very blessed to wear the hat of just being your friend, which I never would have had this friendship in this family if we had not been here. I finally wear a hat as a thankful member of this congregation for all that you've done and served for the 30 years that you've been here. Emma's here as a representative of one of the thousands of children's lives she has changed because Emma was here for preschool and kindergarten and she was in kindergarten in that room, with as a Terry. matter of fact, with Miss Terry. Yeah. So on this day, we have to take the moment, which is just nearly not enough to thank her and honor her. So we have um, created this beautiful granite plaque, which is going to be permanently installed at the academy. We'll find just the right place on the wall. This one is for you to keep and take home. It's the same thing. But I, we, to try and summarize what we wanted to say in this small space was so hard, but here is what we chose to put on the plaque. Dedicated to Rhonda Carr, director, in honor of 30 years of dedication and faithful service in educating and loving the children and families of Beautiful Savior Academy, February 5th, 2023. And I will simply end with Matthew 25. Well done, good and faithful servant. Oh boy. Why do you think I put him up there? I know, right? Oh my goodness. That was a humdum digger. We got you, didn't we? She had no idea. All righty. Uh, now what we want to do is ask Mary, Mother Mary, to come up and she's going to read a letter um, from Pastor Kate, one of our previous pastors. So Mother Mary, please. I love this. Their family all calls me Mother Mary because Dale called me that, my, my husband, right? So they all call me Mother Mary. I got all their kids through confirmation. That's all I can say. Okay. <laughs> yes, this is a, a, a letter from Pastor Kate, and I said I would read it today. Pastor Kate was our pastor at this church for, I'm going to guessing, 27 through 29, I believe is the right, the right dates on that. So. Happy 45th anniversary, beautiful Savior Lutheran Church. Greetings to you from my serene home in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I continue to serve two ELCA congregations, practice as a spiritual director, and work to complete my PhD in cultural mythology and depth psychology. Wow. God has guided me in the ways of faith and its diversity, having served congregations in Seattle, Santa Fe, Boulder, San Diego and Trinidad, Colorado, since last we met. In March, I will celebrate 30 years of ordination, and as a pilgrim in the faith, I can truly say God has blessed me deeply with joy, love, and hope, fueled by the power of the Holy Spirit to bring healing and wholeness to our world. It's hard to believe it's been over 15 years since I accepted the call to serve beautiful Savior Lutheran Church and make the move from Seattle to Tucson. And it's been 14 years since together we laughed as you roasted me for my 50th birthday. If I remember it correctly, I was gifted a walker with a horn and prune juice. I can happily report today at 64, I still don't require either of them. <laughs> Thanks be to God. <laughs> Our ministry moments together were many. The joy of worship in the beautiful Savior Sanctuary, timpani drums on Easter morning, wonderful music by the choir under the skilled musical talents of Greg and Becky, and strong laity willing to creatively bring the gospel to life in new and untested ways. Our participation as a congregation in the Synod-based Ministry Leadership Institute opened our eyes and pathways as to how imaginative the human spirit can be to bring the church into the 21st century. God, through the knitting circle, touched lives way beyond anything we could ever imagine. 
To this day, my friends in California testifies to how a prayer shawl from beautiful Savior Lutheran Church and worn by a young father of two saved him from terminal cancer. Praise be to God for your information. The prayer shawl I started back in 2008 remains unfinished. <laughs> Pearl one, knit two was not my gift, even though Karen Johnson tried really hard to teach me. I may not have learned to knit, but I did learn to make Karen's famous popcorn salad. So good. Thanks, dear Karen, for the recipe. I could go on and on how a beautiful Savior has shaped me, but I think the one story that has strengthened my faith through the years since my departure transpired at the time our world was reeling from the attempted assassination of Gabby Giffords and the murder of so many innocent lives. I remember how, following the celebration of life for Randy's precious aunt, Lynn Lehman, we made our way to the fellowship hall where we went into lockdown. Together we prayed and sang hymns as we waited to hear if it were safe to emerge. It wasn't long that we learned more fully the violent tragedy of that day. It was a Saturday morning and our world was rocked. The safety we may have felt was shattered by the intersection of mental illness and gun violence. Sadly, since that morning, thousands of others have lost their lives in our country. It's not the violence I wish to highlight, but the faith and rally of community that followed the tragic morning. One week later, on Sunday, as I prepared to lead worship, a very young, blonde, curly-haired Seth Peterson came into my office. Pastor Kate, will you help me? Yes, Seth, what do you need? Pastor Kate, I want to choose a prayer shawl to take to Christina's mother. I want her to know that we are praying for her. She needs a prayer shawl. And so it was. Faith was claimed in the innocent voice of a young elementary aged boy who has experienced the unbearable loss and grief of his, bu his bus buddy and classmate Christina killed by gun violence. Seth delivered that prayer shawl to Christina's mother and it wasn't the only prayer shawl gifted that week. Sandy knew the family of the shooter. They lived on her block. Sandy, too, came to the office and chose a prayer shawl. She took it to the parents of the shooter, knowing full well that their lives would never be the same. Into the bag where the prayer shawl was placed, I sent a letter to the mother and father, offering the safe comfort of beautiful Savior for their spiritual needs, if needed. We have a God of love, and our God was with them, the message read. They needed to know God chooses life, and they were God's people, too. God's people. About a month later, a letter arrived at the church office addressed to me. Their gratitude was overflowing, just knowing that God's word of light and comfort in the darkness of tragedy from beautiful Savior had touched them. That letter remains in my treasure chest to this day. And so, all, and so do all the names that are found in the memorial garden. I see Dell and the tasty biscuits and gravy we would share over breakfast at the local diner and the political conversations <laughs> we could never agree about. <laughs> Yet we were in fellowship. I see Marshall, thanks for stopping by, his niche reads. His love of movies and for my little pugs, Otis and Ziggy, who have crossed, long crossed the Rainbow Bridge. I see Anne LaPere and her unending perseverance and advocacy for human rights and black lives. I see Jeff, who as a Star Wars movie lover knew that the force of God's love was with him always. And I see my brother Charles, whose ashes rest at the foot of the garden cross. And finally, I see my mom, my dad, my brother Michael, and Valerie, family all risen in Christ and listed on the memorial wall. Choose life, my path reads, a plaque reads on the wall. No death date, too much to see and do. I encourage you, beautiful Savior, to continue to follow God's command from the book of Deuteronomy. Choose life. Always choose life in Christ and continue to share your faith with the world. I am reminded of the words of sociologist and author Bren Brown in her book, Atlas of the Heart. She writes, compassion is fueled by understanding and accepting that we're all made of strength and struggle. No one is immune to pain or suffering. Compassion is not a practice of better than or I can fix you. It's a practice based in the beauty and pain of shared humanity. May your human faith continue to deepen and grow in the years to come, and may the compassion you nurture for your neighbor continue to shine as a beacon of light and hope for all the world to see. Happy anniversary. 
May the blessings of God peace fill your hearts with hope. Pastor Kate Schlechter. Thank you, Mother Mary, and thank you, Pastor Kate, for those words of inspiration. And so now we're going to have a real brief video from Karen Johnson, who is our Mission Leadership Academy leader. So, Kevin. My name is Karen Johnson. I want to tell you about something that has made an impact in my life from Beautiful Savior Lutheran Church. In 2008, Beautiful Savior Lutheran Church and four Phoenix congregations were chosen by the Grand Canyon Synod to participate in a program called the Missional Leadership Academy. Five members of our congregation, along with Pastor Kate, intern Martha, and a coach, formed a team. I was excited to be a part of our team. The Academy was an 18-month program focused on helping congregations grow as missional congregations, helping people to grow in their faith, and equipping them to participate more fully in God's mission in the world. It culminated with the teams developing and sharing a project that they wanted to start in their own congregation. After our first weekend retreat, I wrote a reflection, and I'd like to share a portion of it today. As a Lutheran from birth, my church has always been an important part of my life. It has been a place to worship, learn, grow in my faith, and to come together with many people who have made a difference in my life. The friends that I have made and the things that we have shared together have always been very important to me. I am being challenged through my participation in the academy to begin growing in my church life and my faith in a way that will make a meaningful difference in bringing God's message to the mission field that lies outside of the front doors of beautiful Savior Lutheran Church. Fast forward to the end of the 18 months, and we had learned a lot about becoming a more missional congregation. We began to put some new things in place. I was blessed to be asked to be a coach for two congregations in Tucson, so I got to go through the process two more times. The biggest joy for me was to hear about all the exciting projects the teams were planning to start. I kept thinking about how we could start some of those same missions right here at Beautiful Savior. These experiences truly changed me in so many ways, and I am so grateful that I was able to be a part of the Missional Leadership Academy. Karen. So, Kevin, we're going to go a little off script here. Um, what I'd like to do now is just ask Pastor John Lundering to come on up. He's got a few uh, words here to, to speak about the creation of our church. So, Pastor? Yeah. Okay, there you go. This is a <clears throat> very special day for me to be here this morning in worship and to be here this afternoon. And what's most special about it is observing, listening, and meeting you people because the church is the people of God. And who are we ministers? We are the servants to the people of God as we together learn more about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Sixty-three years ago I was ordained into the ELC, the Evangelical Lutheran Church, which today is the ELCA. And during those 63 years, I've pastored churches. I've done extensive crisis counseling as a counselor. And in the year 2006, I had an opportunity to become a chaplain at an Arizona state prison. And I stayed there until 2012 
when I retired at the age of 79. And what an experience it has been for me in life to work with people of all different cultures and backgrounds and personalities. And I discovered that we human beings, all of us here, have much, much more in common than we have differences. And we live in a world that somehow keeps seem to trying to be push us apart. No, God wants us to be together. I share with you something that's very important to me. At this stage in my life, I wholeheartedly believe that the most resilient and unyielding fact that we human beings will ever, ever encounter is the eternal and all-embracing love of our God. And you know, it's there for us 24-7. All we have to do is accept the gift. And I would say, as Jesus has taught us, and as we've heard from the Apostle Paul and the scriptures, we need to take, be willing to take, the leap of faith. So, where do we start making this happen? We start in our local congregations, where we have been gifted the gift of the Holy Bible, in which Jesus lays out for us in the New Testament as the presence of God, all the things we need to do in order to make this a world where the love of God shines forth like the children did today with the flashlights. It's all about light overcoming darkness. God, our creator, savior, and Holy Spirit has given all humans, which include us, because we're all created, says the Bible, in the image of God. He's given all humans the potential to transform God's whole creation into our harmonious unity, a communion of love and a communion of life that is grounded in our God's divine and total giving unselfishly of his love to us. Where can it happen? In our church, in our churches. Not only do we have the gift of the scriptures, we have the gift of the sacrament of baptism, where we come together and celebrate new life in Christ. We have the gift of Holy Communion as we head today in the service where we gather together and taste the blood, drink the wine, eat the bread, which is all a reminder to us week after week that we are one in Christ. We are the body of Christ. And as a community, and I certainly have experienced it today, where you can laugh together and where everyone that I met, I know I'm probably one of the oldest ones here, but everybody is so kind and gracious, uh, welcoming me, and that's what the church is all about. The reason I'm here is because in the 70s, 1970s, I was a pastor in Tucson in the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. And I came here in uh, 1967, and I came here uh, and have a church, had a church on the east side, and mo my best buddy, in the ministry was a man by the name of 
I called him Al Badosky. Albert Badosky and, and I got together all the time and we were trying to figure out how we can make the ELCA churches grow. And then all and behold, we had an opportunity in the 1970s to meet this young man who came into the community and he was a pastor. I think he was an assistant pastor, he did a lot of things. But Bert and I said, we want to get to know this guy because he's a people person and we want him. And maybe someday we can even have him in the same church with us. And we thought and dreamed and talked about it. And then we observed Pastor Dan. And what I was just saying is very important to me because in the latter part of the uh, 1970s, I experienced everything I had just said about the fact that a, a congregation or a group of people who are dedicated to loving and to sharing the gospel was starting to happen by Dan Hodson, his wife Jane, their children, and these wonderful people that gathered around him with their families and decided that they were going to be a new body of Christ. But they needed a place to go. They needed a place. And I just wanted to share with you in closing <clears throat> that Dan and some of you who are here as, who started this fellowship did not give up. And I experienced in that movement something that I will carry with me to the rest of my life. And I get rather uh, emotional about it when I think about it because I experienced it in the late 1970s. Here was Dan and his congregation, and they were willing to take that leap of faith. And when you take a leap of faith, you are sure that somehow God, this loving God who wants to build harmony and wholeness in the world, will be there through his spirit to see something happen. And Dan and those who were with him did not give up. They went to different places. Bert and I kept saying, we've got to find a place for him. He needs to be in our church. And we were determined that wherever they settled, we were going to have ministry with him. And you know what happened. But Dan and those of you and now this congregation seems to be very focused on the fact that we as human beings and as Christians need to broaden our horizons. We don't know everything. We have to realize there are many things to learn, but we have to be open to the guidance of God's spirit. And God's spirit is there, blowing in the wind. And God in his love wants more than anything for we human beings to come together and be united and to do what Jesus taught his disciples to do and which Dan and his community were doing, and that's follow me. Because in doing so, we reach out to people wherever they are and we love them unconditionally. That's what grace is all about. And it happened. And so this anniversary in 19, of 1978 is very, very special. There aren't too many of us still around, maybe, that were here at that time, but I was. And believe me, it's a time of celebration. So, beautiful Savior, it has happened. God has made it clear that he will continue with this uh, body of Christ in this wonderful, beautiful place to fill you with his love. And because of that, we come today, 45 years later, to celebrate what has been happening, what is happening, 
and what's going to continue to happen in the future. And believe me, that's breathtaking. In closing, I share that an anniversary like this is a milestone, an event, marking a stage on beautiful Savior's journey, where the body of Christ, which is everyone here, can be repossessed by the all-embracing love of our God, who will never, ever leave us alone. He loves us for eternity. So, we celebrate, and my only words to you are two. Journey on. Amen. All righty. Thank you, Pastor John, very much. Now we'd like to call to the podium Al Steichen for Building for Christ and Community. Thank you, Al. Appreciate it. So the slide you're looking at right now is what we see today, and most all of us mortals, this is how we see it. Go to the next slide, please. But you can also see it now via Google Maps from the air. You don't have to get in an airplane. But the reason I've got this slide up there is, uh, if you can go back, the reason I've got this slide up there is because a lot of people don't read blueprints and site plans and that kind of thing. So let me just go through from right to left. Um, on the right was the original academy, and in the middle is Werner Hall, where we had our brunch, and now we're in what we call the new sanctuary, or the current sanctuary. Um, the slide that's up now, I don't expect you to read it all, so I'll tell you the important things. The, um, on the right-hand side uh, is what was the, or what was the original sanctuary, uh, built in 19, or 1981, I guess, and opened in 82. Uh, and then, jump all the way to the west on the left-hand side, that's the new sanctuary, and that's in uh, what on my side was light blue, it looks a little grayish blue. And then, that was in 1993, so it seemed like it went every 11 years, because in 2004, guess what happened? We built on to this building, new offices, expanded the uh, Narthex, and built Warner Hall. Um, but I didn't have a chance to say, the house just south of here, which is where all those, that key is, um, so that slides back up, you'll see that house, just a white square down at the bottom, that's the Werner's residence, Bill and Erna. And I think without them, it would have been, from what I understand, a little hard to get this thing built because they were so gracious in getting this land for pretty much next to nothing, I understand. You, that's a different story. So, so, in honor of them, you can go to the next slide, that hall that you had brunch in was named after them, Werner Heritage Hall. So, at any rate, I just wanted to point that out. I also want to point out just two, a couple of statistics. The buildings on this campus are almost 20,000 square feet. So you know what size home you live in. If you live in a 2,000 square foot home, this is like 10 of those. So this is a sprawling campus. That includes, of course, the academy buildings. Also, what's covered up by me now is a note at the bottom that says, we also have five, over five acres of land. So we've got a lot of room to expand, I guess is what I'd like to say. So on that five acres, I guess, let me just summarize what we've got going on here. We've got the buildings that we just went over. We've got the meditation path that the Boy Scouts built. We've got two playgrounds, uh, both for the academy. One was built as an Eagle Scout project. And we've also got hardscape, what I call the parking and the pedestrian and vehicular circulation. And besides that, there's a little bit of landscaping to take care of here. Right? So I'll be followed here by Don and Greg, who will give you a little more history of sort of how this, some of these things came about. Thanks a lot.
Don, you're up for the Thornydale School and the first buildings. All right, we'll make it short here. Yeah. Okay, if you've ever moved, you've probably church shopped. We did that here in Tucson. <clears throat> of course, we visited a few churches, but our, truly, our trusty scouts in God's hands led us to beautiful Savior at Thornydale, Thornydale Elementary. Our scouts, our scouts were four-year-old Sarah, two-year-old Greg, and baby Beth. It was 1981 VBS. The school cafeteria was a mecca for people from different backgrounds, all searching, feeling the love in action from the founders of this worshiping group. We found what we were seeking. The kids weren't the only ones enveloped in the love of Christ. We all celebrated and shared what we were given. Joni and I knew that we'd been led here by the Holy Spirit when within a month of joining this faith-filled group, our son was diagnosed with leukemia. The congregation rallied and we were blessed by their support and Pastor Dan's prayers for us and with us. <clears throat> I believe it was late in 81 that the ground was broken for the site dedicated to be beautiful Savior Lutheran Church. Uh, and you can see in the upper left there, Pastor Dan with the architect and the plans there, and, the, and Bill and Erna Werner in the upper right. <laughs> and of course, here was a depiction of, of the uh, sanctuary to be, and a beautiful shot of the uh, building with the rainbow out there on the, on the east side. Uh, <clears throat> Bill and Erna Werner had, had offered property at a low cost and an architectural firm was employed and soon the building took shape. The courtyard pavers, I recall, were, uh, <coughs> were an effort that was directed by Mark Burke. Mark and Tony Burke were uh, mm -hmm. old members that, uh, that <coughs> anyway, uh, a lot of people gave a hand there putting down those pavers, but Mark was really instrumental in getting that, getting that done. Our sanctuary with the orange chairs, you can see in the, uh, <laughs> in the lower right. And of course, uh, that's the north building on the, on, the, on the upper left there with the uh, veranda just getting supported there. And <laughs> the old cross and the northwest corner of it. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah, 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 here we go, here we go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, uh, you, could, you, you can see if you go back to that uh, one with the orange chairs, uh, you can see that arched window out the, uh, behind the, uh, the altar there. <laughs> That south building of the academy was just this great hall with, uh, with the orange chairs that allowed for uh, movement so we could create other spaces and part temporary partitions. But that, the, what's critical here was the, behind that window was that beautiful view of the Catalinas. And, uh, and <clears throat> it was strategically located so that Pastor Dan could feel that everybody was wrapped with attention when in fact, that wasn't always the case. <laughs> it, uh, anyway, the North Building had the uh, offices and the uh, uh, and a rec hall and the old kitchen and, and the bathrooms. And there were no bathrooms in that South Building at the time. But the hall was filled with, many times, with celebration. And, uh, <clears throat> and then in time, more land was purchased toward toward Thornydale, and, uh, and there was, a, there was a, a house there that was also used for, uh, for Sunday school classes and things, so. But anyway, it, uh, it's, just, it, it's just great that uh, as the church expanded, Thank you, Don. Greg, the Memorial Garden. Uh, I'll really try to be uh, brief on this. Can you turn, uh, put on the slides? So 
this picture has everything and nothing to do with the Memorial Garden, and that's what I'm talking about. This is a picture of a Celtic cross in Ireland. The area where this was made was established in the 12th century, uh, 1100 years ago. And when we were out there visiting, the thing that was amazing was there, the cemetery surrounding the church ruins is still actively used. There were flowers, fresh flowers in various garden plots. And that's why I showed this picture and you can move to the next one for the Memorial Garden. We have um, been working on the Memorial Garden since 1998. This is a, a view graph slide uh, from our first Memorial Garden concept meeting with the council in 1999. If you go to the next slide, this was our first congregational meeting slide. And if you don't show me, just show the pictures. That would be better so we can really see this. We embraced the circle of life within the church where you would uh, be baptized into the church. Many of us here were, including myself. You have uh, celebrated uh, weddings here. Could you go back to the last one, sorry? Um, celebrate uh, weddings and then memorialize in the memorial garden. Now you can go to the next one. I kind of walk, talk with my hands, so this is kind of confusing. These are pictures of the evolution of the garden, where the picture on the left is the, the brochure plaque. One of the main emphasis we had in the memorial garden was focusing on being at the foot of the cross. This is our copper cross out there where we can have an ash scattering area literally at the foot of the cross. And the picture on the right is a new memorial garden scattering area for our furried friends that's down on the meditation path. If you could go to the next slide, it highlights some of the evolution where we opened the memorial garden in 2004. In 2010, we expanded from one memorial plaque wall to another, which is right inside the front gates. And then in 2020, we established a memorial park uh, garden wall area for furried friends so we could have plaques, especially for our furried friends. And then 2022, last fall, we opened this second ash scattering area for pets. Next year is our 25th formal, uh, our 20th formal anniversary of the Memorial Garden, and we're continuing to grow. We're not at 11 centuries yet, we're just kind of at a quarter century, uh, but we're hoping to continue expanding. And thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. And I know we're running a little long here, so our past folks are, are you're dismissed. Our presence folks can come on up. Uh, we're going to celebrate the present right now, and Sig Smith, who is the coordinator of our community connections, is going to uh, going to uh, go over the uh, the program of, of not only the community connections but everything that we're doing to embrace the presence right now. So, Sig, you're up, and I got the cattle prod. So now we move to the present. Much is still the same. Services are largely unchanged. The music has always been good. No new buildings. One thing that has changed is there's a greater emphasis on reaching out to the community, part of grace. We'll concentrate on this. Well, good afternoon. Um, my name is Lynn Nalen, a lot of you know me. And um, I want to talk to you today about the Outreach Ministry Blankets of Comfort. Now, this ministry was inspired by a very close friend who taught us the beautiful technique of crocheting the edge of blankets. We took that information and we spent time planning and creating and started our ministry by having a meeting so that everyone could see what's going on with this ministry, which brought in many people to our ministry. Uh, here's how it works. 
First, we make the blanket kits that contains a blanket, cut to size, holes along the edge to crochet in, and the yarn to crochet with. We place them out in the narthex where anybody who knows how to crochet or wants to learn can check out the kit, work on it at home. When it's complete, bring it back and give it to us. Now, the next thing we do is it had the blankets before they can be delivered. They've got to be blessed. They're brought here in the church. We've stacked them up here, and the whole congregation blesses the blankets. Now they're ready to be delivered. The next step there is we deliver the blankets to Tucson Medical Center for Children and to Lutheran Social Services and to youth on their own. And those are given to people who are going through difficult times and that blanket brings them warmth and peace. Now to support this ministry, we occasionally have a fundraiser. And the fundraiser that's the most popular is the silent auction. And um, along with the silent auction, we give them dinner, dessert, and entertainment. That is a lot of fun. So for this ministry, all the members involved. It is just a simple, important gesture to give the gift of a soft, beautiful blanket to give them big smiles, and that's what tells us we're doing God's work. For me, it is the very heartwarming fact that this ministry and all the ministries at Beautiful Savior Lutheran Church Give to, every, to give to different places in our community. And for that, it, it is a true blessing. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Now, to bring on a little bit more, we got Joni, the wild woman Swanson. She's going to talk about uh, Sunday dollars. Thanks. Well, wait, this, is, this is my prop. Who'd have thought? A dollar bill. Dollar bills would go so far. Our Sunday Dollars program was born somewhere on Interstate 10 between Phoenix and Tucson. Not sure what the exact mile markers were, but I do remember that Saturday. Karen Johnson, Sig Smith, and I had attended a stewardship conference in Phoenix, and we were on our way home. The keynote speaker was dynamic and shared some fabulous ideas. But the one idea that really resonated with us was what his congregation was able to do with $1 bills, not 10s or 20s, but the lowly $1 bill. There, you can hear that now. Um, <laughs> they paid off their mortgage. They paid off their mortgage. Every dollar bill that was in the offering plate every Sunday went toward their mortgage payment. Now what could we do with $1 bills? We wanted to do something different because we didn't have a mortgage. <laughs> Wait for the laughter to subside. <laughs> Actually, we did have a mortgage, a sizable mortgage. We still have a mortgage, a sizable mortgage. But we wanted to focus on our immediate community. The following Monday, Karen and I connected with the principal at Thornydale Elementary School. And were there any fa families there who needed help? Well, duh, yeah, there were. The, later on, as Sunday Dollars gained steam, the program expanded to help families at Butterfield Elementary School and the Gap Ministries Child Foster Care Program. Through Sunday Dollars, your Sunday Dollars, we, beautiful Savior Lutheran Church, has been able to provide backpacks, school supplies, books, food, clothing, and shoes on a regular basis to those who would have really had to stretch their budget or go without. I remember one little boy at the shoe store. It was February, rodeo month. There were enough Sunday dollars for each child to get two pairs of shoes. 
This little boy picked out his shoes, and then upon learning that he could get another pair, he asked his foster mom if he could get cowboy boots. My last view of this little boy was as he walked out with his new boots on saying, I really like these boots. <laughs> now all I need is a horse. <laughs> One last story. One Sunday there was an inordinate amount of $1 bills in the offering plate. Wow, this is great. We found out later that on a previous Saturday night, one of you, oh, geez. <laughs> maybe two of you, probably four of you, had been playing left, center, right on a Saturday night before church. Um, and all of their winnings went to the Sunday Dollar program. So you might want to check that name out, the, the game, excuse me, the game, left, center, right. You never know how far those dollar bills will go. <laughs> Thank you, Joni. I don't know what she's talking about. So then our next one is Janice Molina. She's going to talk about Tihan, ICS, and Crop Walk. This lady takes the best pictures ever, by the way. Well, yes, I'm Janice Molina. I don't know about the best, but I take a lot. Um, I'm not going to talk about ICS today because I have two more programs that are really near and dear to my heart. So the first one is Tihan, which is Tucson Interfaith HIV and AIDS Network. As its name implies, this is a support group for people living with HIV and AIDS. And Beautiful Savior is a sponsor of Tihan. I have to tell you, before I began volunteering, I actually thought I was fairly well, I was aware of the world around me. Well, several years ago, I joined Tihan as a volunteer. Let me tell you, my eyes were opened and my heart grew. It changed my life. It changed my life. Tihan has many a ways to assist their care partners and one is Paz Cafe each month. This is a great fun event with socializing and fabulous professionally prepared meals, care packages, and bingo. I come alive on the third Thursday of each month, especially the month when Beautiful Savior is one of three sponsoring churches or faith communities. We supply the food, the gifts, and the prizes. So I go and be with my friends, and we eat. I get to sit and eat with them. We talk, and we laugh, and we hug. They get their care packages, and then they play bingo. And I get to be the bingo captain. <laughs> so I see them have a wonderful day that does not cost them one cent. I have to tell you, I have seen utter despair. I mean utter despair, turn into hope. It changed my life. The second outreach program I want to tell you about is the World Church World Service Annual Crop Walk. Over 20 churches in Tucson participate in this event, an actual walk to raise money for world hunger, including right here in Tucson. I tell you, I am so proud. You see the pictures up there, right there. Every year, every year, Beautiful Savior is the leader in the number of our members and our friends coming together, putting on those bright yellow shirts, and we walk down University Avenue, bringing awareness to world hunger to everybody around us. It, it's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. So friends, I just wanna tell you, as most volunteers will. When you volunteer for a cause you really believe in, your heart will just grow. And you actually yearn, I mean yearn for more hours, more time to donate to your fellow man. So, would you, would you, would you, would you join me in some of the many opportunities Beautiful Savior is offering? Thank you. She still takes the best pictures. 
Okay, now we have Mary Havenhill. She's going to talk to us briefly about the lot on 22nd Street, something that her and Asher just rock. Mary. I have my little group coming up here. They're going to hold my hand. <laughs> Actually, I am Mary Havenhill, and you are who? Asher Havenhill. Asher Havenhill. <laughs> okay. Together, we are part of the Community Connections team. One of our outreach programs that we do is feeding the homeless lot that is over on lot 22. Now, this is because of Alexia Cerna. She was 12 at the time when she came to me and asked me if our church wanted to join this. And I was like, I don't even know what this is, but okay. So <laughs> she, um, we got together and there were members from the congregation that went with us um, to do Christmas. That was the first thing that we had done together. And as you can see in the pictures, uh, Asher was Santa Claus. Santa <laughs> <laughs> so he got to be Santa Claus that year. Um, but then after that, we became more involved with the lot. And Ariana can't be here today, but she's the one that's in charge of all this. So we decided one year, let's get together and try to do Thanksgiving. So we started doing Thanksgiving, and um, two of the things that we, that Community Connections does is Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, but in order to do this, it's a really big job, and the people that you see on the stage is just part of what Community Connections is about, bringing them in to help. Now. Um, in the picture, you can see um, Linda Weber is somebody that has always helped with putting our little baggies together for Halloween and uh, Christmas. Um, but in the lower picture, you can see uh, the Cub Scouts and their families have come together to help with Thanksgiving. So this year um, for Thanksgiving, we actually fed over 225 people at the lot. Now, that was everybody coming together through Community Connections. The other big event that we did was Christmas. And um, for Christmas, we did 150 meals. Um, Bob and Janice Lewis, um, together with the Miranda School Bus um, friends, they put together 60 children's bags that were filled with different types of uh, coloring books, colors, toys, hats, gloves, that sort of thing. So again, they reached out and there's community connections happening. Uh, we also, they also were able to give us $100 in gift cards to use that we gave to the adults there at Christmas. Um, so because of this team, uh, the Cub Scouts and their families, uh, the Academy Teachers, which is, um, two of them are here, which is Cindy and Miss Lisa. And Miss Lisa and her mom put together all the plasticware for the entire year, which is such a big help to the lot because they do the plastic with uh, a little hand sanitizer packet, roll them up, bag them up, put them in bags of 100, and that's something that is so very useful. Again, that's something that is an outreach. Uh, Miss Cindy and her son always do pies, and their pies are amazing. Um, but again, that's something that, you know, we reached out, and her son has joined us. Um, and then we also have, uh, down at the end, is Miss Teresa, who is a friend of mine who put together these big, gigantic uh, posters to help people join in and do more something that is new that I had no clue what was going on and I was, I was asking her, what are we doing here? Because I don't know. <laughs> but she was able to tell me what we were doing. Um, but along with all this, the congregation has been such an enormous, um, what do I want to say, support. They have, you guys have given us so much in everything. When we've asked for something, it's a, an outpour with stuff. And so because of that, I thank you for being a part of that with us. Um, we wouldn't be able to do this without your guys' support, without their support. Uh, and I just wanna point out that 
community connections is not just the adults here. Um, there is a picture of uh, Jay. I don't know if you have that picture, Kevin, to put up there. He, at Christmas time, two little boys coming together. Um, didn't know each other. One little boy saying Merry Christmas to another little boy. Who that other little boy was so grateful to get that bag from Jay. And he held on to it so tight, it was so excited for it. So, you know, Community Connections is about everybody coming together, not just adults, but the children as well. So, thank you for that. And I think Asher has something to say <laughs> before you clap. I just wanted to tell a short little story about one time when we went to the lot. We usually go on Sunday afternoon. That's when they feed people. And they also feed people on Thursday night. And the first time we went on a Thursday night, we don't do that very often, the, some of the people that were waiting to be fed were getting a little bit angry. And I, it seemed at first kind of inappropriate to me. But then later on, I found out from Adiana, who runs the lot, that some of these people haven't eaten since Sunday. And I don't know, it just... <laughs> really, it's hard. But it, it kind of reminds me of something that Martin Luther said, that God, may need, God doesn't need our good works, but our neighbor does. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Okay, one, one last outreach that we do to embrace the present. Sig, you want to talk about the CAP team? So one of the most recent large programs that we've done is the conversion of the nursery into the grace room and the support of the community assistance program, or CAP as we call it. It's a partnership of this church and Northwest Fire and Golder Ranch. The ladies say they work for Northwest Fire. It was started when Pastor had an idea, and he talked with Randy. Randy's in the middle of everything. Randy agreed it was a good idea, and the rest is history. You've noticed the Grace Room is in existence now. Heather and Stacy from Northwest Fire go to the Grace Room any time, day or night, to get short-term material assistance items for some person or family who has had a traumatic experience involving either the police or the fire department. No permissions required, no forms to fill out. They have the combination to the door. The assistance might be for a family that ran out of a burning house in the middle of the night in their pajamas and their daughter is wearing the only diaper that they have left. We never know. So, have we given away very many items? No. Are we happy with that? Yes. <laughs> we don't wish a traumatic experience on anybody. But we are prepared and ready if that happens, just like the police and the fire departments. We support them. And I need to make sure that all of you know that we also give assistance in the same type to other people who have not had an interaction with the police or the fire, okay? You can go to the office and there is help. We have stuff that people need when they have problems, okay? So, remember that. Community Connections uh, is not a new reach, outreach at uh, Beautiful Savior. It's been going on for a good while. However, in the last few years, there's been an increase. How, why has this been successful? First reason is leadership. Okay. People committed and capable to work with like-minded people to get the outreach done. 
good ideas with no leadership don't work. And we know that from sad experience. A few of our Community Connections leaders include Karen Johnson for Sunday Dollars, Mary and Asher, Haven Hill for the lot on 22nd Street, Janice Molina for a variety of things, and Andy Anderson, the king of the grace room. He makes everything work there. There are a lot of others, but you don't want to be here all afternoon. No, we don't, see? That's right. <laughs> The, no. The other reason is the support of the congregation. If it weren't for the congregation, none of the leadership would be worth anything. This is a very generous congregation. It is interested in reaching out to the community, and it enthusiastically supports all of our efforts. So. We're trying to make, make things better and all of that. You can see we have our logo. You've seen it in the bulletins and various things like that. It's a Celtic cross, just like the processional cross, on a Ukrainian yellow background, so it shows up. So how do we summarize community connections? It's really simple. You use a school bus shirt. You're all going, duh, what's a school bus shirt? This is a school bus shirt. What color was your school bus? <laughs> On the back it says who we are. Beautiful Savior Lutheran Church. On the front, it says what we do. God's work, our hands. Thank you. Thanks, Sig. And so the present, oh boy, I get more money. See how that works? <laughs> the present has, has uh, left us. Now we have, um, Laura Steichen that's going to talk to us about our music ministry, and then we have our choir that's going to sing to us. So, Laura, you want to dance right with us? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Laura Steichen. I started here at BSLC in the fall of 1999. I am a cradle, probably to the grave at this point, Lutheran. I feel at home with the Lutheran doctrine and liturgy. So when choosing a church, I look at the Lutherans first, if they are available, and then I'm drawn to a church that has grace-centered, happy people and a choir that can sing in harmony. <laughs> Why is harmony important to me, you ask? Garrison Keeler explains it best for me. He has said, Lutherans are bred to sing in four-part harmony. It is a talent that comes from sitting on the lap or next to someone who is singing alto or tenor or bass and hearing the harmonic intervals. I do believe these people who love to sing in four-part harmony are the sort of people you could call up when in deep distress. If you're dying, they'll comfort you. If you're lonely, they'll talk to you. And don't ever worry about being hungry or in need of a cup of coffee. One of, um, on one of my first visits to Beautiful Savior, I found the people, the grace, and the choir was singing in beautiful harmony, keep your lamps trimmed and burning, keep your lamps trimmed and burning, keep your lamps trimmed and burning, the time is drawing near, near nigh or something. It was so uplifting for me. I really didn't know what the words meant, but I wanted to jump up, grab a lamp, trim it somehow, and keep it burning. Instead, I joined the choir. <laughs> My mission to find a church with lively people, grace-centered people, and people who like harmony was complete. Belonging to beautiful Savior and our choir satisfies my hungry soul and uplifts my spirit. 
So now, I, gotta let, I get to let my spirit sing with my friends. The song has lots of beautiful harmonies, and it is called Come Build a Church. The words are especially fitting, and follow along. Right there. Beautiful words. What this church is about.
How about that? So now we have a special presentation. So Becky, would you please join me up here? And I think that uh, Greg, James, come on up. Aaron, there he is too. Linda's coming as well. We have a little presentation. Great. Hi. A 20, um, Greg Swenson, in case anybody doesn't know me, but um, 22 years ago, I took over the job as music director here after a sudden departure of our previous director on Palm Sunday, no less. In the ensuing two years, we saw a series of short-term accompanists. We then found ourselves interviewing and auditioning to fill the position once again. For me, not being at all skilled <laughs> on the keyboard, it was vital for, that we get somebody that I could work with or depend on to help me out. One of the things that was part of the interview was to play a selection from our repertoire. Becky was obviously one of the interviewees for the position. One of the favorites of the choir you heard this morning was um, Ferris Lord Jesus or Beautiful Savior. <clears throat> That's the piece I selected for anyone who applied. It was one that I felt that could challenge the skills of all who interviewed. Needless to say, Becky rose to the challenge and I almost immediately knew this was the right person for the job. As we got to know each other and work with each other, Becky became sort of a mentor that kept me up in my skills. She was also my personal accompanist for the many times that I did special music as well. One of the many highlights for me was that during my tenure was doing a full two hour, now you gotta do this, you know. <laughs> full two hour production of Song of Mark by Marty Haugen. Featured many solos as well as choral vocals. In addition, we had additional instrumentation, sound and lighting, and those who participated are very aware that this was a very time-consuming undertaking for everyone, especially the accompanist. While she could have complained and said that it wasn't part of the job, Becky never did, at least not to me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we all found ourselves at the church multiple times a week, rehearsing until it finally started coming together. Not only was she there at every extra rehearsal, at one or more, she was sitting with a young child on the bench with her and still not missing a note. We worked together until 2012 when I came to the decision to move on and explore other opportunities, one of which involved being able to worship with my partner and another was a period of discernment considering becoming an associate in ministry, now called a deacon. While this didn't happen for multiple reasons, stepping aside was the right thing at the time. Becky, even though we haven't talked for a while, I consider you a friend. Congratulations on your 20 years of service to Beautiful Savior Lutheran Church, and congratulations to Beautiful Savior for 45th anniversary. Now, I came onto the scene just in time to welcome Becky to her 15th year. And uh, she's been an inspiration the whole time as a musician. You don't always meet people who are eager to continue making positive steps in their musicianship at 65 and 70 years old. <laughs> and... <laughs> oh, <laughs> and... Um, also coming in at 25, I was pretty quickly asked to do a, um, like our annual reviews. And Becky came to me, 15 years my senior at this church and more years my senior as a human who makes music, and asks me what she can do to s step up her game. And I was like, Becky, I don't know, I'm 25, I just got here. <laughs> 
But I said, I said, I suppose, I was like, so I suppose there's one thing we might try. We, I said something about like melodic improvisation because she's always done so well with her harmonic improvisation during the prayers and preludes. And she said, okay, I'll do it. And she ran with it. And that is the part that's an inspiration every time to continue treating every day like a school day. Um, and if nobody, if you have missed the story somehow, I tell this one all the time, even now, to the new folks at the choir in Northridge, is Becky has essentially learned to play the piano twice. And it's inspired me to finally get off my behind and do my Hannon exercises, because she tells the story, I, I, I think I always lose track of what exactly happened to your hands, Becky. No, broke my wrist. Okay, broke her wrist was not going to be able to play. In my head, it's always like they both got ran over by a motorcycle at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> but she went, to, she was told, but she, she was asking the doctor, like, will I play the piano? That's very important to me. The doctor essentially says, from the impression I've gotten, is like, well, you should probably try. And so she went back to those hand and exercises and retrained her fingers a second time. I, I however, hardly have the dedication to train myself in it the first time, and Becky's done it twice. I think that deserves an, 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 a round of applause everywhere I go. Yeah. <laughs> so congratulations again on 20 years being here. They're so blessed to have you, and I have been too. I'll be brief, because I'm, I'm the youngest serving <laughs> <laughs> director of music, but I am older than Aaron, so. <laughs> um, I haven't told you this, but uh, you remind me of my aunt. Um, I grew up in the church, of, I went to First Baptist Church of San Francisco and attended the academy there, so there's a lot of parallels to this day uh, with the church academy here. Um, and actually my aunt was a, uh, she's still alive. <laughs> she uh, has been a p church pianist her whole life. Um, and she was actually my first piano teacher. Um, and she's very warm, just like you, and encouraging. Um, and yeah, I've, in my short time here, um, you've really been such a, like a, a rock and just a really passionate, loyal uh, servant. So. Uh, I'm so happy that I've been able to work with you. I'm happy that I've been able to work with all these wonderful musicians here, um, and I'm looking forward to more time. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, we, have, we have a gift to present to you. Should, you should open it. Yes, that's why we performed before this. <laughs> Yeah, I know, but people online can't hear if you speak real loud in here. Music Ministry Appreciation, we hereby honor Rebecca Solomon in honor recognition of 20 years of faithful service as pianist at Beautiful Savior Lutheran Church and Academy. Without a doubt, you have encouraged and inspired so many lives through your musical ability and unselfish service to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May God bless you. Next to the podium is Linda Claussen. I'm a member of the choir. And on behalf of the music ministry, I present you a photo scrapbook titled 30 Seconds of 20 Years. In it, you will find the five music directors whom you played for, Greg, Jeff, Jeremy, Aaron, and James. 
Thank you, Becky, for 20 wonderful years. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's where we are currently. And now my, my job is done. I hope I didn't offend anybody. Where's Don? Where's Sig? You know, just kidding. But uh, Pastor David is now going to lead and talk to us about the future. And ladies and gentlemen, our future is so bright, we might have to wear shades. is a sign. Yeah. That got knocked off. That's the way it's going to be. All right. Yes, I'm here to talk about the future, where we can live long and prosper, right? Do you all realize in the history of everything like this, 45 years ago, your current pastor was living in the suburbs of Chicago playing with Star Wars toys. So, in inspiration of that, I invite you to join me as we go forward and we will serve the galaxy together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Does that work? All right. Now, just also at around that same time, a young man by the name of Tom Brady was born. And just recently in the news, he celebrated his second retirement. Tom Brady has often been referred to as the GOAT. Go ahead. Gary. Gary. Nope. There we go. But I doubt that the GOAT has ever had a huddle with an actual GOAT. <laughs> and yes, I think I'm the one on the right. That was the last vacation Bible school we did in, 20, in the summer of 2019. It was weird animals, and somehow I fit. But then again, that was tradition. We've always done it that way before. Why? Because, move it, it seemed like from the get-go, I first arrived in 2013, and that December, the Vacation Bible School team was having this meeting and going, hey, we want to do something. Pastor, do you think we can dress you up and do something? I said, like what? A bee. So I became Buzz Light Bee and raised money for hives, for good gifts for the ELCA as part of Vacation Bible School. And yes, that meant I dressed up like a lunatic and yeah. I then the following year, I was Captain Shaved Ice. Not my name, the name given to me. The next year I was Devious, the droid. Somehow that name I earned. But along the way, I also, you know, I also became Kagman. I won't say the name because it involves a scream. It was the name, the first sound his mother made when she gave birth to him. That was his name. That was the year of the earthquake in Nepal. And that was Himalayas was the theme. And so I was the caveman, and I helped raise money out of everyone for, for Lutheran disaster relief in Nepal. Each and every one of these things was just an opportunity to have some fun for a purpose. 
Along the way, I was faithful writer. And that caveman costume came in handy a little bit later on when I did John the Baptist. At which point, it seemed to me, given the conversations I had after the fact, that most people were more interested in the fact that they discovered their pastor had a nipple than anything else that, the, that John the Baptist was saying. Ah, <clears throat> uh, focus, people. Needless to say, Dr. Seuss, whatever the heck that was in the middle, again, weird animals, and even the book fair gnome, and all the other ways, I became like the Ken doll to so many people. And you know what? That was awesome. Yes, I have my professor, a professional costumer. She's watching uh, Karen Johnson, who we saw a video for before. She, um, she's not here because she just had hip replacement. And so she's home and she's doing well. Hi, Karen, if you're still watching. And... Uh, uh, one time we were in a, in a meeting, in a Zoom meeting, and I introduced her as my professional costumer. And the bishop went, wait a minute, that's a title? <laughs> I said, it seems to be a beautiful savior. But again, it's all for fun. We're not entirely sure, you know, but one of the things that was based about all of that was we're always seeing what was going to happen and what might happen next. And so, and the ability to just have some fun to share the message, Garrett. I, that goat became the holy goat. I know the jokes are bad, but they stay, they keep coming. Getting wrapped up back when toilet paper was cheap. I had five people volunteer to wrap me up. And only my son, after a bit of time, finally came up to unwrap me. That should have been a sign. And occasionally, I think I am a kind of a big deal as the world's okayest pastor. But all of these things were not entirely, all of these things kind of came up and came along. And all these different opportunities showed up. Because let's face it, we know this truth. Next, we do not know what the future may hold, but we know who holds the future. That is where we are. On this verse today from the gospel, but also the one the team chose. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. When I first started coming here, people went, oh, beautiful Savior, that church on a hill. Yep. Now one of the nice things I hear more and more of, and I did hear other things when I first came, was, oh, beautiful Savior, I remember when. Or this one thing happened when. Well, let's face it, folks, we are in a tough situation. The world is very different from 73, or 78 to 23. Very different. Just for the record, the ELCA, as an organization, projects that one-third of its congregations will close in the next five years. And we ain't alone in that. When I was in seminary, there was a church... Uh, author who projected that half of all Christian congregations would be closed by 2020. A lot of people like to blame COVID. COVID was an accelerator, not a reason. But I want us to stay focused on the fact that we didn't know what the future may hold, but we know who holds the future, and that's what got us through to this point in time. I had people ask me, why in God's name are you celebrating the 45th anniversary? Very simple reason. We got through COVID. We took the plague, and we kept going. And that's what we're about. But as we look to the future, we have to be honest with everything. From Jim Collins, good to great, the Stockdale Paradox, you must maintain unwavering faith that you can and will prevail in the end, regardless of the difficulties, and at the same time have the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they may be. This is not a time for just mindless optimism. This is a time for faith. Why? We are Easter people. We know of a Good Friday. We do not go back. We know of a Good Friday. We say hallelujah very loudly on Easter Sunday because we know of Friday. But we also know that even on Friday we can call it good because there's an Easter Sunday. 
And God's already been at work with us for a long time. Next. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Good, we're in the desert. We can use a river. We really could use the Colorado River, but that's something else entirely. God's already at work. How? Think of the things you've heard about today. What's already going on with the academy? Community connections. There's a brand new health and wellness council that's starting up. AA groups. The original group that was here for years is now coming back. That makes four groups. Monday, Tuesday, Friday, and Sundays. And each and every one of those groups is, you know, the, the newest group is probably the smallest so far, and they'll be starting in about another week or so. But every other group started out about 15 to 20. They're now pushing about 100. But look at what the academy has done. Community connections and its inclusions. And, you know, Mary did a great demonstration of what the lot on 22nd. Community connections isn't about the church going out and connecting with the community and giving them something they don't have. It's about connecting all of our needs and resources and abilities for the benefit of the community. Why? We have a mission. Generosity, reaching out, advocacy, compassion, and encouragement. Each and every one of those things is an important aspect and a role in our lives. And it helps us show that grace is real. That's our mission. How we live it out is going to be fun. One of the things, we got to grow inside out. What that means is simply this. As I said with the community connections, we have to find other ways of going to the out. For each and every one of us, we have to realize that we have an evangelical command to share the good news of God in word and deed. But that also means for us as a congregation, we have to attend to what we're doing here, so we help you do that. Because let's face it, normally we do a good job of Lutherans telling other people about Jesus Christ to other members of the church while looking at each other's feet. And I'm not saying about going and holding some banner or megaphone on the street corner. I'm talking about continuing to do and nurture those things, those new things that God is already doing in our midst. And whatever new might come too. But the other thing we got to do is we got to expand the circle. If we think we've got it all and we can do it all, we're not going to get very far. We're part of something larger and we need to be something, part of something larger. The ELCA talks about being church together. This congregation was started, and there was three other congregations in the area. The four churches on this side did a lot of ministry together. They did a lot more ministry than what anyone would have done with all of them by themselves. What are we able to do? But we also have to look beyond our own resources, like again with Community Connections, but also the Grace Center. That Grace Center was paid for by a grant from the Synod. What are some of the partnerships and connections that we can build and grow with other agencies and organizations in Tucson and around the world to help us live out our mission? To let people know grace. And we get to include them in. That's our call. So there's two words that come to mind. Intentionality and engagement. If you were thinking I was going to come to you with the answer and the program, sorry, I'm only the Holy Goat. (laughs) I'm not the Holy Spirit. But how are we being intentional with what we're doing? Are we being mindful of how we're being and how we can organize and be very intentional in what we're doing? but also engagement for everybody online. We got through five, we got through two years of all kinds of stuff and we were able to help and connect with people. There are people who watch our our services from the border of Ukraine in Poland to Germany. We've had people in Africa, Asia, and South America zoom in on our services. We have people who are now joining the church who first found us online. 
And there are some people who do not feel comfortable coming into the space of a church just yet, but they feel welcomed by this congregation because we're online. But how can we be more intentional and engage them more? Because the big thing is community. In a world that seeks to divide, we've become more partisan, more tribal, more xenophobic, more, you know, we, we fear our neighbor more than we love our neighbor. If there's a, a light that needs to be shined upon the world, that's it. We are the body of Christ. And Jesus doesn't turn people away from the table. That's what he does. So, what are some things? The academy. Academy does great things, but life is changing. And more importantly, I mean, they're doing some important upgrades, thanks be to God for a grant and other support that's coming in for that. that but those buildings are 40 years old. Hmm. What could we do? Community Connections Health and Wellness Council. How are we going to grow our connections with our with the partner organizations. What new partner organizations are there? What groups are you a part of that you would like to see us get connected with? And more importantly, do you realize when you get connected with those organizations that it's not just because you're a nice person and you're doing what you ought to do. You're sharing grace. God loves you and you're showing it. But maybe that's part of it. The Life of Faith Initiative is one of those. Martin Luther says in vocation, a Christian cobbler isn't someone who puts little crosses on his shoes, but who cares for his neighbor and his work. One of the things we got to do when we look at the inside out and expanding the circle is, how are we as a church preparing you for witness in the places where you are, your work, your schools, your neighbors? There's a cohort starting up. A group of churches are going, hey, We've got to reclaim this. Church is not about pastor. Church is about us. If you're interested in any of that, please. That group will be starting up in the fall. Online and hybrid. Folks, sometimes we like, we like to think about Facebook as, you know, or other social media as the spawn of the devil or whatever. Well, if you think that there's a problem with Facebook, you think there's a problem with Instagram, you think there's a problem with any of those, so what are we doing to make a difference? What are we putting out? Ah, my favorite subject of all, endowment, stewardship, finance. These are a few of my favorite things. No money, no mission. No bucks, no Buck Rogers. We are reforming and rebuilding our endowment team. Are there ways in which you can give a legacy gift that would support the ministry of this congregation going on into the future? Or there's all kinds of things, and I don't know any of them, those that get to tax advantages and all that kind of stuff. But also for all of us, our stewardship, our time, our talent, our treasures, how are we using them? Notice all of the different ways, especially time and talent, paid off in the reasons why you're here. Someone's greeting, someone's welcome, someone's love. But yes, treasures too. Got to put the lights on somehow. But then as we go forward, are there ways in which we can be better stewards with you know, energy kinds of things? Forward to 50. As I said, the ELCA is saying that one-third of its congregations will be gone in the next five years. The old HR question, when you're looking for a job, where do you see yourself in five years? Where do we see ourselves in five years? I see us completely and totally celebrating 50. Why? Because the seeds are already sown they're already starting to grow. But what are we going to do with them? One of them is definitely, it is literally called Forward to 50. And I don't know where the forums are. They'll have to go out later. Yep. In amongst of all the hubbub of today, there is a letter and a pledge card 
You can tell that this is my favorite thing. I made so sure that you all got it. Oh, well. But what are the things we're going to do? Our ability to get to 45 was partially fueled by your generosity in the 40 for 4 campaign that we started at the 40th anniversary. There was a whole bunch, we repainted, we recarpeted, we've added more tile in here, we got the new speakers, there's all kinds of things. But that was all these different things we had planned and in our minds. No one planned for COVID. But that money then provided cameras, screens, streaming gear, computers, we don't know what the future may hold, but, God, but we know who holds the future. All of our acts of stewardship are acts of faith as we place into else, someone else's hands what God has blessed us with. So we have a lot to celebrate, and I look forward to seeing what we're celebrating at 50. So we're Lutherans. We open and close with the word. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Do we believe that? That's faith. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly more than we can all ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen? Amen? That is the hope to which we cling to, folks. Let's dare God as we go forward to 50, showing grace, generosity, reaching out, advocacy, compassion, and encouragement. The world needs love. They will know we are Christians by our love. And remember, God loves you, and so do I. Amen. Amen. Mother Mary, do you have anything for these people? One thing before everyone disappears. Just a big thank you to everybody who put, have worked and put this together. This was an involved process. As you can tell, a lot of things to celebrate. Come here, dear. Keep walking. I'm just filling time until you get here. I'm just, you know, because I'm going to bring you here because I'm going to embarrass you in public uh -huh. in front of God and everybody. This young lady stepped forward in September and said, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, that's right. We got the anniversary. I guess we should start planning it. I wonder who should do it. Well, I guess I said something. So I guess it's me was her exact words. It's amazing what God provides. And we all know that God provides a lot in this young lady. So oh, thank, you. thank you, Mary. Do you have any other instructions or anything else for these good people? I just, I was inspired by what you had to say. And I just say, let's live it forward. That's all I'm going to say. Let's live it forward. Hallelujah, yep. sister. All right. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.
everyone at Beautiful Savior Lutheran Church. This is Pastor Mary Armstrong Reiner. I was interned there from 1993 to 1994, and I'm speaking to you today from beautiful McDonough, Georgia, which is about 30 minutes south of Atlanta, Georgia, where my husband and I, David, reside with our boys, Christopher and Sam, who are now 22 and 20 years old. David and I will celebrate 30 years of marriage this coming July, and I remember fondly moving to Tucson a few months after David and I had married, where we both did internship in the Tucson, Arizona area. I remember that at this time of the year when I was there in 1994, that uh, Beautiful Savior was part of a program where the homeless would stay overnight at Beautiful Savior and we would feed them dinner and breakfast. And I remember what a powerful experience that was and so grateful that Beautiful Savior was a part of that. I just want to say a word or two of thanks uh, to the Congregation of Beautiful Savior for having me and say a special hello to Pastor Dan and to Jane Hodson and tell them that I think of them over the years and um, pray that they are doing well. I also want to say a special hello to uh, the Swanson family and to Mary Spidell and to Teresa Lappin. Teresa was on my lay committee and um, I remember her fondly. So many of you may not have been there during that time, but I just want to tell you that it was a great experience for me and I grew so tremendously from being a part of Beautiful Savior. I also want to remember fondly Pastor Will Erickson, who has now gone to be with God, who served on my lay committee and was a tremendous asset and really helped me to learn a lot about being a pastor. From time to time, I ran into Delee and Tom Rehack. Tom served as the head of my lay committee, and they live here in Georgia as well, and we see them at different Luther, Lutheran events and remember our time at Beautiful Savior when we gather together. I want to tell you that I'm so thankful that you are still an active, vibrant congregation in Tucson, both in your community and throughout the area, throughout the state, and in the world. And I know that you are doing great things. And I pray that you will be encouraged and emboldened that even though you may not be as big as you once were, but isn't that true of every congregation because of COVID, that you still have many wonderful people among you working as saints of God, making a difference in the world and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ in love, in word, and in deed. So thank you for having me today. I wish I could be with you in person, but sadly I could not. But I look forward to hearing how today went, and I thank you for inviting me and remembering me. God's blessing to you all. Take care. Hi, I'm Becky. Beautiful Savior has been part of my life as long as I can remember. I was also baptized, confirmed, and married Lutheran, and we baptized our daughter Olivia at Beautiful Savior. I loved all the faith-based based activities and events that I participated in over the years from childhood. We had vacation Bible school at Thornydale Elementary before the church was built. In addition to making necklaces with macaroni and seashells and the fun lessons and singing, um, I couldn't wait for snack time with the orange drink from McDonald's and the yummy treats. I also loved the fellowship of youth group and doing the fun activities like bowling, pizza party, hiking, etc. Of course, my parents, Lenny and Doug, were always involved serving the church and the community in many ways. Um, you could count on seeing their faces every Sunday to greet the guests and members at the door and to help them with whatever you needed. I also have fond memories in the earlier years of mom and dad hosting many church swim parties with popcorn and homemade ice cream. Beautiful Savior guided me, guide, I'm sorry, Beautiful Savior guided my parents to be good, dedicated, and faithful servants of God. Always volunteering and helping the church, community, and people in need. I try to be a kind and caring person to every person, a, a caring, I try to be kind and caring to every person I meet as the church and my parents have taught me. Um, beautiful Savior has helped me to be a better person. It's hard to imagine my life 
and my family's life without being brought up Lutheran and part of beautiful Savior Lutheran Church. Thank you. Good morning, beautiful Savior. My name is Wendy Grunfell, and Becky and I are going to be going back to back, and we represent the Pfeiffer family, Doug and Lenny. I never stop to consider what my religion and my church means to me. It's always been there. It's always been a part of my life. When I was 18, I met my husband, Ivan, who was not born a Lutheran. He did come to church with me and with my family, but he saw church from a different perspective, one that I had never even considered. We were married in 1981 by Pastor Dan. When our children were born, each of them were baptized. It was a custom that he didn't know anything about. When they were old enough to get confirmed, they went to confirmation classes, which was another custom that he didn't know about. And I was able to explain to him the process of what it meant to them and what it would mean for us. One thing he did understand was that our church was a mission church and I was raised in a mission family. Not that we went on a mission, but that our goal was to help those who were less fortunate than us. Luke 12, 48 says, to those who much has been given, much is expected. And this was something that I was raised with in the family. Not those words per se, but nonetheless, it was a way of life. Uh, when we re when we married, I did realize that not every family had the same foundation that we had. So what does beautiful me Savior mean to me? Well, it means everything. I was able to live beautiful Savior through my family, which I was born into and was given upon birth as a birthright. So I finish by saying, be kind to yourself, be kind to others, and pass it on. And now my little sister, Becky, and I will tell you that she is the nicest one of all four of us. Though my sister Sherry might argue with you, with me about her being nicer, I'm gonna say Becky's the nicest. And since I'm here and she's not, I win. Have a good rest of your day. Here's Becky.